Good morning, Union. It's me, Jerry Catherine, here on July 5th uh, for Sunday School. And I thought since it is the 4th of July weekend, who better to have um, on with me to teach a Sunday School class than the Reverend Dr. Chaplain, U.S. Army Chaplain, retired, obviously, <laughs> got the beard going on, Robert Warden, known to me as Daddy. Okay, that greeting was uh, a little overdone, but I will just take that. And yes, COVID-19 did this to me. But anyway, hey, we look forward to doing this with you. And uh, let's open with prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, for your grace, for your love, for the blessings you give, for freedom that was sacrificed by Jesus for us. We thank you for that freedom. Give us his grace and his spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Daddy, uh, something that has stuck with me since um, childhood on and through adulthood that I think about this time of year especially is the Chaplain Corps motto, Pro Deo et Patria, for God and country. And when I think of Pro Deo et Patria, I think of the story in Matthew 22 when Jesus says to the Pharisees and the Herodians that um, memorable line of render to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is the things that are God's. So given that it is America's birthday weekend, I thought somehow we could weave Pro Deo et Patria, Matthew 22, this weekend um, into a lesson for the good people of Union. You, you know, mean? I was a little uh, disgruntled maybe that you forced me into this a little bit. Now I'm really see what you're doing. Yeah. You have suckered me into a great taboo, the topics of religion and politics, both all at one time. So I'm not for sure about this, <laughs> but let's locate that verse in Matthew 22. Let's just look at it. You quoted it, let's put it in context, and listen what it says in Matthew 22, 15 through 22. And it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth, and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Okay, so you have the Pharisees, who are Jewish leaders, who are educated and very wealthy, but they despise Rome. Yep. And you have the Herodians, who are nominally Jewish, so really only Jewish when it's convenient for them, but also educated and wealthy, but active supporters of Rome. Really, they're Rome's puppets to keep the Jewish people under control. The Pharisees and the Herodians usually don't get along. So what's that saying about sharing a common common enemy? Yeah, nothing brings people together more than a common e enemy, does it? Mm -mm. Two of the most powerful, although mutually opposition, oppositional groups came together for the purpose of entrapping Jesus. But it seems like at first they were approaching Jesus with flattery, saying stuff mm -hmm. like, you have integrity and you teach so well. Um, and um, you could care less what other people think of you or even what your students think of you. Seems like it, flattery. Is that really flattery? Or is it something that we do on a regular basis? There's this uh, facade that we put on this charade that, that we do, that we uh, calling them hypocrites, and they were there really to entrap us and snare Jesus by getting him to say something they could use his words against him. This makes me wonder how Jesus would fare in today's Twitterverse or the 24-7 yeah. news cycle where everyone is picked apart and their words are used against this or that or even sometimes the speaker themselves. Yeah, doesn't that happen anyways 2,000 years after Jesus spoke those words in Matthew 22? People use Jesus and his words to defend their side, their view, their agenda. We do that all the time, I think. Some, at least I do. I do. And I would imagine these words about God and country are especially no exception. So 
a great point, which is why it is so important, I think, to locate these words of Jesus in their context and to seek to understand stuff that first century listeners would know, like the significance of the Pharisees and Herodians. Although they were enemies of one another, they came together to work together to entrap Jesus. Yes, that's uh, no doubt. And it's important to remember that Palm Sunday has already happened. Kind of odd talking about Palm Sunday. We just saw fireworks go off on this 4th of July, and yet we're talking Palm Sunday. But what's in, important in the context in the previous chapter, Matthew 21, Jesus is already process, uh, processed into Jerusalem being hailed as a king, as the long-awaited Savior, as Lord. So these Pharisees and Herodians and really the Roman Empire are all probably on high alert because of Caesar. Caesar. So one of the things, Caesar is, was called Lord. And that coin that Jesus asked to see says, Tiberius Caesar. August son of the divine Augustus, high priest. This denarius reminded the people who paid this poll tax to the Roman Empire that Caesar was divine, at least for them, ruling over the sacred and the secular, ruler of all things. In fact, as Rome became more and more of a superpower of the century, it forced all citizens to address Caesar as Curios, Caesar as Lord. And by the time Tiberius was Caesar during Jesus' time, the emperor of Rome also bore the title Pontifex Maximus, or High Priest. And that is what is reflected on that coin. But remember that scene of Palm Sunday mm-hmm. that has already happened. Jesus rides into that massive crowd ha- hailing him as Lord and shouting, Hosanna, Rome, the Pharisees, the Herodians perceived Jesus as a threat. And so it makes sense that they, the Pharisees and the Herodians, would work on a bipartisan deal. Can you imagine a bipartisan bipartisan deal to bring down this man who people were calling the Messiah? So when the Pharisees and the Herodians ask, is it lawful to pay the emperor taxes or not? If Jesus answers yes, that would discredit Jesus with those who were very critical of the Roman Empire. And if he answered no, that would obviously get him arrested by Rome. It seems like a lose-lose situation for Jesus. I can see now where both the Pharisees and the Herodians want to trip him up and get him in trouble with the government or shunned by the very people who are following him. And therefore, it would, it would benefit both parties, the Herodians and the Pharisees, to keep things as they have always been, to keep up the status quo the power and the wealth with the Fer- the Pharisees, the Herodians, and Rome. But does Jesus answer yes or no? Not exactly. It almost sounds like Jesus didn't take his own advice <laughs> in Matthew 5 when he said, Let your yes be yes and your no, no. In Jesus', in Jesus fashion, he gives a very ambiguous answer. That leaves room for interpretation. Here we are. Here we are again. (laughs) Some have said that in these verses, Jesus acknowledges two separate spheres, the sacred and the secular. Uh, But I disagree a little here. (laughs) To have two spheres is to, in some ways, acknowledge Jesus or acknowledge Caesar as divine as co-equal with Christ. But we, like the first century Jewish people and the earliest Jesus followers, they were and we are monotheist. One God. One God. So that's who we are. But calling, so calling Caesar Lord would go against everything they and we believe. Think back to the Ten Commandments. What are those first two? I have, have no other gods before me. One. And number two, don't make any engraved images or idols to worship. Both are essentially under fire in the question being asked. Jesus knows all this. And I think it's because Jesus knows and understands people. He knows, as we have seen, the motives, even the reason behind the motives of the Pharisees and the Herodians and their attempt to entrap question. To me, it seems Jesus understands our human condition very well, that we are complex human beings living in a lot of tension as both followers of Jesus, but also at the same time, citizens of this world. So I hear Jesus saying to us today, 
First things first, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it, to quote mm -hmm. Psalm 24, or even reiterating something Jesus said back in Matthew 6, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and manna. We are people of God first and foremost, and our loyalty, our allegiance belongs to God, and then country. The title Christian should define us as parents, as sons, as daughters, as students, as employees, as employers, and as citizens. citizens. So, pro dea et patria, for God and country, heard it so, so many times, but I agree that God is first. Jesus is really saying that, but what he is not saying is that as citizens of whatever nation, we should not pay taxes as uh, taxes to our governments. It is very interesting that the language Jesus used when he says, give or render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, is dead towards language. You're a Greek scholar. <laughs> dabbled here and there. <laughs> oh, yeah. You dabbled more in Greek than I. So uh, why don't you, what was that word for dead Apodidomy. towards? Apodidomy. Yeah, Apodidomy. you say that so well. And sometimes I stumble in my Texas I don't know accents. If I'm it well. But I think you're doing pretty well, better than I do. But Dr. anyway, may differ, uh, maybe not. he won't listen to it. <laughs> she. But she, okay. Uh, which is to repay what is due or pay off to pay debt. So that's what that word is, to pay a debt. By all means, do your duties required as a citizen. But in doing so, you do not have to assent to what empires like Rome are asking of their citizens. Mm -hmm. For example, in the case to call Caesar Lord, in paying your taxes, you're not calling Caesar Lord. And I don't know. I personally have a hard time with this. The tax they are paying, they these Jewish people, are they're, what the, the tax they're talking about is a poll tax. And Rome isn't using that tax to build nicer schools or better roads or to do anything beneficial to for the common people, especially the lower class, uneducated Jews or outsiders who were the majority of Jesus's earliest followers. They were basically paying a tax themselves to keep themselves oppressed. Taxation without representation, I say. Well, they weren't exactly a republic as we experience such a system today, something many people forget, dear daughter. In the eyes of Rome, Jesus and his followers were represented. The Pharisees and the Herodians represented, they occupied those seats at Caesar's table. Yeah, but little good it did for the majority of the kinds of people who followed Jesus initially. The Pharisees and Herodians line their own pockets with some of that poll tax money, keeping the wealth and the power to their own generations 1%. Should I say this? Oh right. man, this sounds like a 21st century millennial American born into freedom. Oh, and yes, I don't hmm. disagree. I am a product of my time and place and my upbringing. Okay. So in a way, you had a pretty big part some in, in making me who I am. Yeah. But... Oh, here it goes again. But yes, I, but can't we put ourselves in scripture and learn from history? Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. In some ways, the world and the people and people all over the world haven't changed that much since Jesus' conversation recorded here in Matthew 22, or so it seems to me. I'm not always accu accused of being like Jesus. I hope I am more <laughs> than not. But in this case, I'm going to be ambiguous okay. like Jesus Lay and say yes and no. Okay. How you think is not how the earliest Christians would have thought or maybe even heard Jesus and what he was saying. Yes, I agree. It was subversive and yet not exactly asking anyone to do anything unlawful by God or even Caesar. At the end of the day, Caesar wanted his citizens to pay their taxes, so pay them, Jesus says, but save your everything for God, because God is the true Lord of all. It's a yes and no. Okay. Agree. But still, my 21st century millennial brain cannot let go of asking. So, what does that mean for us as followers of Jesus and citizens of this country today? Because Jesus also does not say in our scripture today that we should give anything that Caesar asks for. So, when Caesar is acting against our values or our beliefs as Christians, 
Do we just keep paying our taxes knowing that God has the final say in the end and let that be okay? Jesus would say, yes, pay your taxes. But remember, Jesus did not come in the way those earliest followers expected or wanted him to come. To come as Messiah who rode in a white horse to overthrow the government. Not a king who rides on a donkey heralding a kingdom built on peace and love with no intention to oust the government through a new system or even a new institutional approach. It's not about all about the rules. Some people think I'm stuck with some rules, but not really. It's all about the relationships. And Jesus is changing our world through relationships. I believe that, but shouldn't one's relationship with Jesus influence how we vote or who we put into office? Well, of course, but we don't have to rely on the government or on Caesar to make the changes we want to see in our world. Jesus was from a place smaller than where you are speaking to now, Irmo, South Carolina. And he ministered around a sea smaller than even Lake Murray. True. And he ushered in a whole new kingdom with just 12 close friends. Plus the women who were. Oh, yes, married. that's true. And, Less than for yeah, And there are some others that, <laughs> weren't anyway, married. those were the immediate surrounding. Yeah. And now there are about 2.3 billion people who call themselves Christian. That is almost 30% of the world's population. He didn't feel the need to work through the Roman Empire to further his kingdom. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, and if Caesar asks his citizens to pay taxes, well, pay the taxes. None of this stops people who call themselves Christians to work for change. God will work in spite of or whatever government is governing whatever country we live. So now it's my turn to be like Jesus and to channel my ambiguity um, so I would say yes and no. Yes, I agree, and I believe that God is creator and ruler of all things, but... but here we go again, yes, that but, big little word, but. But as followers of Jesus, we cannot be silent while Caesar oppresses and ostracizes and obtrudes their immoral ways upon its citizens. So yes, I will pay my taxes, but no... I will not do so and also turn a blind eye to all the ills of Caesar. Isn't that what Jesus is not only saying, but that is exactly what he does throughout the ministry? His ministry? To me, that is even a piece of patriotism. So is patriotism different from being nationalistic? Because I find Jesus' ambiguous answer hits on a very internal conflict that I personally feel as a Christian, especially on Sunday, even so maybe this weekend, but really any Sunday and every day. I feel an internal conflict as a Christian and a U.S. American who is very proud to be an American. I would consider myself very patriotic, but it makes me uncomfortable to be patriotic in church. To say you're seeing things like God bless America, heralding some kind of American exceptionalism, or to even have the American flag displayed in the church sanctuary. Because for me, when we gather on Sunday, we come together under one banner and under one song, and that banner and song is the song of Christ himself, who unites people all over the world, who transcends time and borders and languages and nationalities and on and on and on. If I'm really honest with myself and you, I have a really hard time putting God first 24-7. But for that sacred hour or two or three hours every week that I come to church to worship, and I am very intentional about putting God first. And while I feel very lucky and call it blessed to be born in a country with rel religious freedom that allows us to freely and openly worship, well, when there's not a worldwide pandemic anyways, mm -hmm. that time does not belong to Caesar, any Caesar. And in fact, that time of worship once a week, should be throughout the week, but that's another lesson for another day, reorients me toward Christ, putting God back on his throne. And I try to channel in those moments God's vision who sees all, who loves all, whether we are U.S. American or Canadian American, German, Iraqi, Ugandan, 
South African, Chinese, Australian, whoever, wherever people are from. Okay, we're getting long here, and I'll just warn the people of Union. Mm -hmm. Brevity is not a forte of mine. This guy <laughs> knows it. It's not his forte either, so we might get a little long-winded here. But so we need to speed um, this up. Get I know, going, get going, yeah, get okay. going. <laughs> Back to the question I initially asked you. Is patriotism different from uh, being nationalistic? This is a question for, that comes up for me when I read Matthew 22, especially in light of this holiday weekend and now on this holy day on Sunday. So maybe we need to ask, what does it mean to be nationalistic? Let's uh, parse the words just a little bit between nationalistic and patriotic. What does it mean between the two? And Webster's, which is a dictionary, it's not just internet online we look things <laughs> up, but yeah, there's actually still a dictionary out there, it defines nationalism as to identify with one's own nation All right. and to support its interests, interest, and now we're going to have some problems. Yes. To the exclusion or detriment of others. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. that was a blackboard not, scratch, I, okay. wasn't it? Yes, I am okay with the first half of that definition, to identify with one's own nation and even to yeah. support my nation. Yeah. We are a product of of the places we are born and we are raised. So even though we have lived all over the world, I do identify as you as American, but I do not, I do not. It makes me cringe. Yes, it sounds like nails on a blackboard, like the second half of that definition, to support the interest to the exclusion and detriment of others. That just does not sit well with me at all in my understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's where I would push back against Caesar. If Caesar asked me to be a part of an agenda to support its interest to the exclusion or detriment of others, I just couldn't do that. To me, uh, that's where Caesar and Christ, they clash. And I would think that there are some, a lot of people, who put their trust and their faith in the power and the might of Caesar over Christ. And as followers of Christ, our loyalty, our duty, our allegiant, allegiance, our faith and our trust is to God before Caesar. And therefore, we must not be silent when, when the Caesar we are paying taxes to does things that we, as people of faith, do not agree with. Christ first. And I do not necessarily disagree. And, you know, a 25-minute Bible study that could lead into 30, which we're on pace to do, or even 40. So we could go all different kinds of places on this. But I think what you're really talking about, to try to narrow this down a little bit mm -hmm. in a short time, and then we'll leave this ambiguous a little bit and yeah. just uh, let people think about it. But we're talking about extremes here, mm -hmm. nationalistic extremes. Aren't there always extremes everywhere? I've lived around the world. I have experienced nationalism in more extreme forms in other places outside the U.S. As much as I've seen it within our own country. Sometimes we as nations magnify the faults of others to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Or to justify what we do, we demonize and dehumanize and degrade countries and people to other in quotes, we do this on a personal or individual level as well. Yeah, every day probably. Yeah, we do. And uh, I hear it, I see it, and unfortunately sometimes uh, I do, do it. it. Yeah. yeah, confession. And I forgive, God please forgive me for that. But here's what we do. We categorize, we label, we stereotype, often magnifying the worst qualities of someone else in whom we want to feel more superior or somehow better ourselves because we put them down a little bit by magnifying the worst qualities. And doing that can bring out the extreme in people and even nations. Yeah. Now, I do not get concerned about this kind of extremism, extreme nationalism in worship. You do or you don't? I, I, I'm sorry. I, I do get concerned. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. yeah, you got to well, Let me drink. I'm going to drink some coffee, okay? <laughs> it's early. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to swallow and choke a little bit. Excuse me, Union. Can I back up? Because I was uh, lost in my, where That's am right. I going with That's all right. this? We're not no, I do either. get concerned about any kind of extremism. Yeah. And it's especially extreme nationalism, especially when it comes to worship. Mm. 
in worship because it becomes distracting, taking the focus off of God. Mm -hmm. So if we don't focus, this is where you and I would definitely agree yeah. that if the focus isn't on God, uh, that becomes a problem. It does. But on the flip side, we do live in a country where we do not have to worry about whether or not we fly our country's flag where we worship. We may have parishioners who get upset that our sanctuaries don't have the U.S. flag or it's too small or too big. But we don't worry about the government enforcers coming into our houses of worship. Our sacred space is a word that I think we've lost a little bit about that sacred yeah. space. We don't have to worry about those enforcers dictating how we worship or what we do or do not do, what we display or we don't display in our sanctuaries. That is a freedom we enjoy in this country, and that isn't the case all over the world. The reality is that we don't worry about government enforcers interfering too much or telling us what to do, but of course, we're still a 501c3, or at least churches are. So we are governed by rules and regulations to an extent but other, in other places around the world, people worry about such things as government inf interference and enforcement, being shut down, being silenced. This is what I think Jesus was really hitting on. The Roman Empire required the Jews to pay this poll tax as a pay-to-play mm -hmm. kind of tax. So the government was more involved in every religious organization back then. Really, if you take a panoramic, panoramic view mm -hmm. of all of this, the Roman government was suspicious of any group or organization they had. They found a way to exert control, whether that was through taxing or imposing harsh rules. Nothing was done away from, done away from Rome's knowledge. They looked at everything, any group, organization, individual, anyone who posed a threat, even a potential yet to be actualized threat, they were shut down. So the Roman government always had their eyes, their ears, and hands, and everything. They were kind of like the original Big Brother. Mm -hmm. That is one thing I remember from New Testament class in seminary, a story about how the Roman government uh, empire was so skeptical and so suspicious of groups and organizations, especially those who gathered in private, so much so that they outlawed things like volunteer fire departments because the firefighters would meet in private. So even organizations that benefited the community and kept citizens safe were held in suspicion in some degree. So I can only imagine the Jesus movement came under a very, very critical eye, especially since Jesus was came in proclaiming a new kingdom and people were heralding him as Lord, Rome, the Pharisees, the Herodians certainly all had Jesus as a common enemy. Yes, and again, Jesus, without working through the government, challenged the status quo and he broadened our understanding of yours, mine, and ours, giving us a more global perspective, even before the concept of language of globalism was part of the everyday rhetoric. But for me, in thinking about nationalism, it's kind of like taking care of, of my family. I'm going to take care of my wife, five kids, that includes you, 10 grand kids <laughs> before taking care of my neighbors. What about our spouses? Are you going to, um, oh, do they yeah. count as family? Hiram's only been a part of the family for like nine years. Is uh, he... I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> okay. You know, Hiram is, I mean, he did a lot of work this weekend he here he at our house in Texas. He put oh. together my barbecue. Yeah, right. I think I'll take that under it. <laughs> Point well made. Yes, I will. Everybody. I will include the spouses. Of course, they're my family. They're family, and I will take care of my family. But that doesn't mean I don't love my neighbor. I do. Nor does it mean that by taking care of my family, I'm going to do harm to my neighbor. I certainly aim to do no harm to anyone. Very Wesleyan of you. Yes, I picked up a do few no Wesleyan. Yeah, do no harm. I remember that uh, someplace back there. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, but I start with the circle closest to me, and then it starts to move out. It moves out to taking care of neighbors, and uh, it keeps getting wider and wider. To take care of the whole world like the world mm -hmm. is your parish, perhaps? Uh, you would have to work John Wesley in, and I would tell you that for a retired Army chaplain, uh -huh. we were truly John Wesley's disciples the world was our parish so i would throw that in as well so i lived a world of wesleyanism of john of course again 
uh, there is always the extreme and it's easy to get all of this out of balance so that we become more and more insular and exclusive to the point of ignoring those who are outside the circle, so to speak. Yeah, this makes me think of um, an article I read in, I think, 2012 from the Wesleyan Theological Society, which I'm a part of. They have a journal about the modern concept of uh, the family unit is pretty new understanding of family and would have been a total foreign concept to people in Jesus's time. And um, our understanding of family, the modern concept of family, as we know it actually kind of hinders the kind of all-inclusive worldwide family Jesus invites us into when we choose to follow him. But I hear what you're saying. Because I also hear there also at the same time when I think about that article, I also think about that old moral philosophy dilemma. I think the uh, moral ethicist um, Peter Singer popularized that ethics scenario. You know the one I'm talking about. You're on a runaway train and you're unable to stop because the brakes have gone out and you come to a fork in the tracks and on one track there are 10 strangers um, that will um, perhaps get run over. And then there, on the other track, there is your only child standing on the track. Someone or ones will be killed by the train. You have the p power to pull the lever, to choose which track you will go down. Which track do you choose? Do you save the 10 strangers or do you save your one child? Instinctively, my mama bear comes out and I would probably um, choose to save my child. I would like to think, I would love to think that I would choose to save the 10 at the expense of losing my own child. I think kind of that channels what God did for us, right? Through uh, Christ. But I don't know if I would choose that because I love my children. Mm. WWJD, what would Jesus do? <laughs> you know, you told me this was going to be 25 minutes. You hooked me into all this. And then uh, somehow, I don't know if I even said yes, but I feel like we're chasing a rabbit. Yeah, I'm lost. And I'm not for sure uh, we're going to find that rabbit in that hole. Think, I'm not for sure we're going to find the hole yet. I don't. I think the lesson, the yeah. point of the lesson is ambiguity. To yeah, be okay that's true. with the ambiguity. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm lost myself. I don't yeah. even know why I was telling those stories. Or where I was going with those illustrations, except yeah, I'm to trying agree. to get back to the notes here. <laughs> Can you just get me I'm back sorry. to the notes? <laughs> I'm trying to agree with you. Okay. This is my attempt to agree okay. with you that I think we all have a tribal instinct to protect our own. Yeah, and I what think, is ours. I think actually think you and I agree more than uh, many people might even realize. Mm -hmm. We really do agree for the majority of the essential things. I think the question we set out to answer is something about the complexity of existing faithfully as Christians who live as citizens of heaven and citizens of a nation. And we do it at the same time. We can't separate that. I am proud to be a citizen of heaven. I'm prouder to be a citizen of heaven even than a citizen of this great nation, of any place in the world. But at the same time, I can't divorce that I am proud to be an, Amer an American. I can hear that. I can almost sing that song right now, but I don't want to chase another rabbit. Okay. okay. But it's a great song. I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. You could have sung that. I know it. I could. I, I'm He's a proud good singer. And we are free. Free to practice our faith as we would like and to have conversations like we were having. Yeah. Free to protest mm -hmm. legally. Yeah. We're free to do that where we can agree and disagree. For me, the extreme form of anything is a concern. Mm -hmm. And when we embody extreme nationalism, especially as people of God, that puts Caesar above God, giving Caesar more than what Caesar is due, as Jesus talks about in this particular passage. Yeah. It's like this. If your rent is 800 bucks, $800, you aren't going to pay the landlord 1000 or at least I hope you don't. No. Well, okay, I'm just checking that out. I knew Hiram wouldn't, but I thought I would get, check that out. No, you pay the agreed upon rent mm -hmm. and not a cent more. When you give to the government, you give what is owed, but you give your all to Christ. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're really listening to in this passage. Yeah. It's not about leftovers or seconds, mm -hmm. but back to the definition of nationalism. Mm -hmm. Now, here I go on uh, pontification on and on and on, but I identify as a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I identify as an American, as a Texan, of course, born and raised. I can't native. get rid of that, but I lived in South Carolina, and I'm proud that they 
fought in the Alamo, and I am because of being that South Carolinian, Virginian, New Yorker, even German and Korean, mm -hmm. even Bosnian, because all of those places I lived, and I found connections and people and ways of life with, with, with whom and which I identify. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say broad, sweeping, ugly comments about the U.S. and about others. But when you connect with people one-on-one, -on -one, those relationships that we have, the stereotypes or the labels or walls begin to break down yeah. so that people begin to see one another in our common humanity. Yeah, I think about this a lot, especially from um, uh, several years ago, I took uh, college students to visit uh, Korea. And one of the girls who traveled with our group was from Hartsville, South Carolina, and she had never left the country. She had never been on a plane. She was very nervous and very scared. And um, part of our trip included two nights where we stay, stayed on the border of North and South Korea. We were about, I guess, like seven miles from North Korea. And she shared with me that she was really, really hesitant about that experience because of all the awful things she had heard and read about North Korea. So she prayed that night that God would give her a sense of peace. And that night, as we all slept with the windows open, she heard the hum of cicadas. This was in July, um, actually around July 4th, um, several years ago. She heard the hum of cicadas and she thought to herself, it sounds like home. And then she had the thought, wow, maybe we really aren't all that different after all. I think God gave her more than a sense of peace that night because it was a beautiful moment, a beautiful story of beginning to meet people where they are as humans who fall asleep to the hum of cicadas on a hot summer's night. And everything Jesus did, I think we, he, and we should try to be like him, he tried to bring us together to see one another as the same kind of different as me, to quote the title of one of my favorite books. Yes, I think... We need to focus more on the good and not always harp on the bad for her. It's definitely changed her life. But it's also about God meeting our needs where we are at that time. Uh, she prayed for peace, and it came in a very unusual way, but changed her life. We have become so critical of our country, of the U.S. Around the world, people in other nations have become so hateful and critical of all the faults and failures of this country. Mm -hmm. And sure, we have them. But we cannot say in one sweeping statement that it is all bad. Just as we can't paint the U.S. as all good, either excusing or turning a blind eye to blatant wrongs. But it's not really just about the either-or dichotomy or even an all or nothing, all bad and all good or all good or all bad. It is really a both-and. We as individuals, as people, as families, even as countries, we all have good and bad. Yes, and in this particular scripture, I think we see that Jesus enters into conversation with people he knows and can malice toward him. He could have avoided conversation with the Pharisees, the Herodians, but he chooses not to dismiss or to denounce them but to engage in conversation. And they left, we are told, amazed. Yes, they understand him better and probably understand understood themselves better as people of God, living in a world constantly vying for our allegiance above God. Or were they amazed that Jesus circumvented their trap? You're choosing to see the good. I'm seeing the bad. Maybe. Well, the thing is, when I was a little younger, I was a little more suspect cynical. cynical is the real word <laughs> yes. yes it is cynical Higher maybe it's a little higher. both in here too didn't you just say something about being at all or nothing and not either are as well touche both and yes both and both and, both and. <laughs> both and. there's nothing to learn by simply acknowledging jesus's willingness to entertain those he had disagreed with there's something oh yeah <laughs> You know, I don't like a text. It's I'm easier sorry. when I'm not living. There is something to learn definitely yeah. from this. Yes. Uh, for you good people union, I do have a text here for somewhat, <laughs> and I have uh, 
bifocals, and it's really hard to see some of this stuff. <laughs> but he's more extemporaneous. Yeah, I, I'm like just, I'm, I'm wing, <laughs> winging wing a little it, bit. I, I like to just, anyway. I have to have a script, otherwise we would be she, here for two she, hours. Yeah, she probably will not uh, <laughs> ed edit that out, so uh, we'll I just gave it to the world. <laughs> Uh, there is something, uh, there to, is learn. something <laughs> to learn by simply acknowledging Jesus' willingness to entertain those he disagreed with. I agree. And they had a pretty civil conversation on religion and politics, yeah. and I think we can still do that today. It's mm -hmm. clear as you read through the Gospels that they never probably saw, saw eye to eye on things, but they kept the conversations going. I'd like to believe some were changed by those conversations. That last little part is so important mm -hmm. that they... Some of them were changed. Yeah. I had to believe that. Well, we know that at the cr at the cross, you know, you hear about the Roman guard yep. was changed. Yep. So that makes me believe that yep. there were Roman yep. officials and yep. Pharisees. And, well, Paul was a Pharisee, right? Yep. So we could go on that lesson for another day. Yep. So maybe ambiguity is part of the point of this lesson, but also it shouldn't be so taboo to engage in such conversations if Jesus did it. So can we, and so maybe should we, as people of faith, we should bring religion into conversation with politics. Yeah, sometimes I hesitate to do that, but maybe we're starting something here. Oh, just keep the conversation going, because I'm not sure um, we really covered much for the people of Union. <laughs> we probably hit on some good takeaways, some nuggets, some gems, for sure. Yeah, I think we definitely gave some points to ponder. And, you know, you even think about going back, connecting this to Palm Sunday and the expectations of Jesus mm -hmm. and certain things. Uh, I'm winging it a little bit here no. without the Holy script. Spirit. <laughs> yeah, but I'm th even thinking about we're not perfect. And what did we do in Lent leading up to Palm Sunday and Easter? There's a sense of looking at ourselves of what is good, what is bad, and building on the good and trying to excise that's bad. So yeah, ambiguity somewhat, but also some things to ponder that are truth. So an open-ended conversation for the good people of Union to continue and probably for her daughter and me. There we go. Good to be with you all this morning. Have a good Sunday. Mm-hmm.